Welcome into Courtside Seats with Kroger, a Charlotte Hornets podcast. Here he is, Chris Kroger. Welcome in. Special bonus episode of Courtside Seats on a Friday as we try to unpack what went down in what we thought was going to be a pretty wild, crazy, unpredictable 2018 NBA draft. It certainly lived up to those expectations. Hornets were on the clock at number 11 until they weren't because they draft Shea Gilgis-Alexander, trade back a spot with the Clippers, and in exchange pick up a couple of extra second-round picks and get their selection. And Miles Bridges, the uh, the wingman out of Michigan State. And then you go back and you make some other trades. You get uh, another second-round pick, 34th overall by way of the Hawks in Devontae Graham. Raleigh kid played his college ball at Kansas. Big 12 player of the year a year ago. First-team consensus All-American a year ago as well. And you get that international flavor as well. 55th overall selection goes by way of Arnoldus Kuboka of Lithuania, played in the German League a year ago. So the Hornets covering a lot of bases in the draft last night, and so we got a lot of ground to cover. Of course, it calls for a special edition of the podcast, Courtside Seats with Kroger. I'm Kroger, and of course, don't forget, you can subscribe, download, rate, review for us in Apple Podcast. Just search Kroger, just search Charlotte Hornets, and you can even search Courtside Seats. Make sure you download, subscribe, and review, and uh, we appreciate that in Apple Podcast. Of course, you can find us on Hornets.com in the Hornets mobile app, as well as our official Charlotte Hornets YouTube page. So subscribe to that as well. We are going to talk to both draft picks over the next little bit and President of Basketball Operations General Manager Mitch Kupchak going to take us through what went down last night in the war room for the Hornets on draft night. We'll lead it off. Our first conversation with the man who went number 12 overall by way of that trade with the Clippers last night, Miles Bridges out of Michigan State. Well, we got the number one pick, well, at least in the first round for the Hornets, 2018 NBA draft, and uh, he he comes in a swap. Hornets trade down a spot, go to the Clippers, Shea Gilgis Alexander goes, and it's a little confusing, and so that's how draft night is, and so we welcome him in, Miles Bridges. Miles, how you doing, man? It's good to see you. I'm good. Good to see you, too. It is confusing, right? Like, for you as a player, and you're sitting there, and then the Hornets draft Shea Gilgis Alexander, uh-huh. and then... The Clippers, and you get a trade, and your name is selected. Like, how long for you before the dust settled where you realized, okay, basically the Hornets selected me last night? How long did it take before you kind of figured everything out? Oh, well, I kind of picked it up after Shea got drafted. Yeah. Uh, My my agent, he told me, he was like, yeah, you're you're going to the Hornets. So I was happy. Um, I was just blessed with whatever team I was going to for sure. Well, you had your whole family here, you had your whole contingent here, and, uh, you're really close with your mom, um, really close with your sister. So, tears being shed last night. How emotional was it in the Bridges household last night? Uh, I don't know if my mom, my sister. I think my sister cried. Um, I'm not a crier though. Yeah, so I, don't, I don't cry like that. But not I, that was, there's anything wrong with that. Like, yeah, you want to no, cry? Not, yeah, it's yeah. nothing wrong with that. Yeah. I just didn't cry. Just not, not, not in your DNA. Uh. But that's a special night, right? And you're really close with your sister, oh, yeah. especially, right? So how just sharing that that moment with them last night, even today, being here and just going through everything, how, how cool has that been? It's definitely cool just bringing them out, um, bringing them to New York, bringing yeah. them to Charlotte, um, everywhere with me, I mean, because they, they helped raise me. So for them to be here with me right now is definitely great for me. What, when was your first memory of basketball, either where, you're, where you were watching or around the sport and you thought, yeah, I want to do. I want to do that. That looks fun. Do you remember when, like, your earliest memories of basketball? Uh, I would say just me playing in the backyard. My dad getting me a hoop. Um, me playing with the older kids. That's yeah. my, my earliest memory of basketball. When did it become? Because you love the game. Like that's. I mean, that's the scouting report. Is uh-huh. you're a worker. You just you eat, sleep, and breathe basketball. Coach Izzo said that about you. So when did that kick in for you? At what age were you realized, man, I just want to like commit everything, all my free time, everything I'm doing to the game of basketball? I, I was at the third grade because that's when I, I was playing. I was in third grade playing with like sixth graders. Um, and I was just – I knew I had a talent for basketball. Yeah. So I, I started dedicating it to, to, to basketball. But eighth grade is when I really think I, I broke out and I thought I could actually make it to the NBA. Um, Even then, at that age, yeah, yeah. Cause why I, was that? I don't know. Maybe because I could dunk. <laughs> you were playing. Correct me if I'm wrong. Like you were playing center at that time. You were, is that right? Like early on, because you were so at that age. I in guess. Great. Um, yeah. Or I guess early in high school because you. Were I was so a big. center, but I was handling the ball. Yeah, bringing the ball up the floor. <laughs> so, yeah. I don't know what you call that. Yeah. 
Um, but back then, you really so that even seemed beyond just a dream. You really thought, man, I, I'm good enough to do this. This can happen for sure. I mean, that was a dream that I wanted to happen. I didn't, I didn't know if it could happen, um, but that was definitely my main dream. And then, so you're going through, you go through Flint, and you're proud to be from Flint, Michigan, right? Mm-hmm. That's sure. that means something. You say I, I came from Flint, Michigan. That means something to you. Definitely proud to say I'm from Flint. Um, they raised me, yeah, um, and that's the reason why I have the toughness and the mindset that I have now. And then you go from there to another tough area because you go to Huntington for Huntington Prep, right? That's where you go play your your high school ball for a little bit. So that's oh. West Virginia. That's another blue collar area. So like you move from blue collar town to blue collar oh. town, but that's kind of where things took off, right? Like you went to Huntington Prep, and that's where everybody was trying to trace you out as as a recruit back then. I definitely, um, Huntington Prep. I, I went there um, to get away from distractions to play top competition. Um, and that's when I really start hitting the weights, start getting my body right. Um, so that's where the NBA body, that's what people are saying. Um, I was just dedicated just to get better because mm-hmm. um, going into my sophomore or junior year, I wasn't ranked. Um, so I wanted to play all the ranked guys and show them that I deserve to be on the list. Um, and that ended up setting me a great spot with the NBA. So I'm just happy that I, that I was able to do that. You played AAU ball, right? Yeah, I played AAU. Did you play – so – I mean, you hear a lot of people talk about that now of AAU ball, it's kind of ruined basketball because now guys play so much and uh-huh. they, they lose a lot. And so that passion for winning and the, the hatred for losing isn't as there. The guys are too friendly now. They don't yeah, have that kind con- Do you feel that that's true or is that you're like, or you can't, do you run counter to that? Like, is your personality one where you're like, nah, I just want, I want to go at guys. Like, I want to compete and I yeah, hate that's losing. True. I mean, guys are too friendly nowadays. Um, Especially on the court, yeah, can't be friendly on the court because um, once you step in between those lines, that's when you it's it's dog eat dog world. What coaches always say for us, um, but after the game, I mean, you can be cool, um, but not during the game. But you think that's that? You think there's something to that with the AAU game? They- yeah, I could see that. Um, AAU is definitely becoming more and more friendly. People are playing more and more free. Yeah, more isolations. Um, I feel like they need to. Just get back into basketball, playing basketball the right way. I think after my year is when it stopped. When it stopped playing basketball hmm. the right way, competition started going down for sure. So you go to Michigan State. Who else was chasing you? You were a top ten recruit. You were a five star recruit coming out of hunting the preps. So who all who all was hot and heavy? Kentucky, right? Kentucky, Oregon, Duke. Uh, Kentucky, Duke, um, Arizona. Those are some blue bloods you're talking about right there. Yeah, Arizona, Kansas. Michigan Definitely State. Kansas, yep. And then we, we were second. Yeah. Uh, so what led to choosing Michigan State? What led to you choosing to go play for Coach Izzo? Just a family environment. Um, when I took my visit there, that's the most comfortable I felt with, within all the colleges. Uh, Coach Izzo made me – I mean, I was 45 minutes away from home. Yeah. Um, but I never actually went home. That's that's how much of a home environment it felt for me. Um, my teammates are great. And Coach Izzo just brought a winning attitude. And so you go, you have a great freshman year, mm-hmm. and you come back, everybody's saying preseason, team of the year, national championships, player of the year, all that stuff for you. You guys had another great year. Yep. But, you, I mean, Jer- you made, you were great because you made room for Jaron Jackson to do what he did yep. as a freshman. And you guys had a great year. But it's almost weird, like we're at a place in the NBA now where, okay, you had a great freshman year, you came back for a sophomore year, what's wrong with you, right? Uh-huh. Like, do you feel like people are saying that about you? Like, oh, you should have come out as a freshman, but... It's weird because I feel like we kill kids now if they come out as a one and done, uh-huh. and then you go back and you go do the team thing again. We say, well, what's wrong with you? You should have come out as a – you know what I mean? It's, I feel like for you, I almost feel bad at times because mm-hmm. you can't win with people, right? Like, And I don't know if you worry about that. Sometimes you just got to play your game and trust the process. But Yeah, I definitely don't try to please people. Um, guys are pulling me back and forth, back and forth, and I, I feel like I made the best decision for myself. Um, I just feel like – they, they they don't like the two and done guys. Yeah. Um, because the freshmen coming in they're, they're so excited to see how they play and if they have a good year then they can be like, Oh well, he's he's one year older than him, he's not gonna do anything in the NBA. Um but it's that's that's the one and done mm-hmm. rule now. Um that's how people think. So I mean I, I feel like I did great for myself. But you're a better basketball player today than you were twelve months ago. For sure, definitely. And it's a lot of it's what mental. That's the, the like just the comfort around the game, knowing the game better. Yeah, the definitely IQ. mental. Um, in college, you have to be physical too. So, uh, I, I mean, I like physicality. I love contact. Um, I played football when I was a freshman, so I love contact. And 
I think that's helped me in the NBA because the NBA is a physical game. Yeah. Well, and you, well, the game in the NBA is, as you know, I mean, you got to get to the basket, right? Mm. So that's something I think you would admit you got to grow that part of your game. You've been great as a spot up shooter, but off the bounce and getting to the basket, you shot great from the free throw line last Uh year. You shot almost 85% from the free throw line. Uh You improve your free throw shooting, but that's the name of the game in the NBA. I mean, James Harden, Steph, Durant, LeBron, Mm. our own guy, Kemba. I mean, those guys are, are great at getting to the rack and getting to the free throw line. Yeah, that's that's something that I should have took advantage of last year. I should have um, been more aggressive. Um, but I feel like after my ankle injury, I was playing too tentative, yeah. uh, settling for shots because I didn't want to hurt my ankle again. Uh, but I feel like towards the end of the year, that's when I start going to the mid post, getting to the basket, into the free throw line, and my free throw numbers definitely increased tremendously. Well, and you dropped, what, 20 pounds since the season's ended? Yeah. You look pounds. good. Yeah, appreciate it. I asked you, I was like, did that come off in a hurry? Like, what happens there? It's just diet and exercise, right? So yeah. does it just come off in a snap like that? Yeah, strict diet and exercise. Um, it, it's hard to stay on a strict diet. Um, the exercise is easy because, yeah. like I said, my work ethic kicked in, but the diet was hard, though, for sure. So that... I mean, you're already one of the explosive players in this draft. Mm-hmm. You can get to the, when you're up there. You sky above the rim. Yep. What's what's that do for your game? Changing your game, just losing that weight. What where, where's the immediate impact in that in that way? I definitely feel quicker. Um, I don't get tired as easy. Um, I I could get a little bit higher off the ground than I could when I was two forty, definitely. But yeah, I, I feel like that helped me tremendously. I don't know if you want to start lobbying yet. I mean, we got a long way to go. I know you haven't even had a practice here yet, but uh, you know the All Star Game's here. Yeah. So you know, just saying, you dunk contest, Charlotte. We need a Hornets <laughs> representative. I mean, it's just if we want, we can start the campaign now. We can just get that rolling right now if you want. Yeah, yeah. Um, How do you, is this too early to think about that? I feel like I'm more of an in game dunker, but okay. I know I'm going to warm up to it. Um, I mean, it's a lot, a lot of good public. It's good for the public, for sure. All right, well, three-point shooting something, obviously, you're known for. I think you shot, somebody had pulled this stat. You go back and chart, I guess, your numbers when you shot from, like, NBA range last year. Mm-hmm. Shot, like, 36%, so that's, that's a good building block. Yeah, and yeah. Um, you love to run off screens, man. I watch you, you're just like, you never stop moving out there. You're ah. always working off cuts and screens and down and pin downs. You're just always moving out there on the court. That's something that I tried to learn in my second year. Uh, I seen Clay Thompson do that a lot with the Warriors. Steph, they come off, they come off a lot of screens, and I seen how successful they were off it. So I was like, that's that's how I learned how to read the defense coming off screens, yeah. um, ball screens too. Um, but it was tough at first trying to get used to playing like that, running around not without getting tired. Footwork was was a big deal. Um, so that that's something that in my game that I improved in my second year. What what are you a what would we call you? Are you a three or a four? Does, I don't know if it even matters. What do I? Are you just a forward? Yeah, what is, was, what is Miles Bridges? I was just playing two, three, four. Yeah, I, I really don't feel like I have a position um, anywhere on the floor. I feel comfortable. Yeah, for sure. All right. Well, you talked to uh, you talked to Michael this morning, Michael Jordan. <laughs> yeah. Face to face. Yes. Uh, yeah. Was that how did what what goes on there? Ah, uh, I don't know. I really don't know how to explain it. Um, he's the GOAT. So just me coming in, meeting him, um, it definitely was surreal to me. Um, but that's my boss now. Yeah. So I got to please him, make him happy. Do you remember, like, actually saying anything, or you just rem- like, it's just all your memory is just being in the same room with him for a few minutes? I just remember saying, yeah. yes, sir, yes, sir. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever you need, Mr. Jordan. <laughs> yeah, for sure. So, I mean, if you're going to get asked this, who's the GOAT, right? I, you're, you grew up a LeBron fan. Wow. Uh-huh. I mean, there's only I, one answer to this, right? Yeah, but 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 Michael Jordan is I don't know him, Michael, Kobe, and LeBron. That's it, your top three if you're ranking right now. That's your top three. Yeah, in that order. Not in that order. What's your? I, order? I don't have an order. You don't have an order. You're just, just putting them all in the same group. Yeah, definitely. Okay, I feel like Michael's always got to be one, and then you can do whatever you want behind. Yeah, that. yeah, yeah. That's what for we'll do for there. Charlotte Hornets business purpose, purposes. That's, that, that's what we'll say. All right. Well, you look, man, you've been just running around these last 24 hours for you. I mean, they've got to be the best 24 hours of your life, but it's oh, been yeah, crazy, sure. right? Yeah, it's, it's going it's by so quick. Crazy. Yes, sir. It's been crazy. All right. Well, we got to find you. You're a Bojangles fan, apparently. <laughs> yeah. We got to find Bojangles, an official sponsor of the Charlotte Hornets, by the way. So we got to we got to get you some Bojangles. Well, you don't. What, what have you had from Bojangles before? Uh, like fried chicken. Fried chicken uh, on the bone or yeah. yeah. Okay. Well, and when I'm feeling like it, I'll get Bowberry biscuit. Okay, now you're speaking my language. Yeah, chicken supremes. Have you had the chicken? Chicken supremes, supremes are good. Woo! Too. You're getting me anxious to go to the airport. Oh, 
Look, you go Chicken Supremes. You make sure it's a large. You get the Chicken Supremes, the seasoned fries. Seasoned fries. Woo! That seasoning on the seasoned fries. What do they put in that stuff? I don't know. Do you get honey mustard or barbecue? Honey mustard. I get both. Okay. I'm not no. That's I'm not mad at that. That's yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah. I feel like I feel like Bojangles has the best honey mustard you've ever definitely, had in your life, right? Definitely. Yeah. You sure. get the sweet tea. I, I don't like tea. I'm not a no, tea okay. Person. No, that's going to change, Miles. You're in Charlotte now. That's going to change. That's I, a thing around yeah. here. We do the sweet tea. Okay. I just don't like tea. I don't think I can warm up to it. Okay. I'll try. No. We'll, we'll we'll figure that out. Okay. Bojangles <laughs> has their famous legendary sweet tea, so we'll make that happen. Hey, yep. Miles, welcome to Charlotte, man. Yep. Seriously, it's a pleasure. We're going to see you out in Summer League here in a few weeks, too, uh-huh. which is going to be a blast out in Vegas. And uh, I'm the rookie around here, too, so it's nice to have a couple of new rookies with you and, and Devontae with us, too. So it's good to see you, man. Yeah, good to see you, too, man. Glad to be here. This is Courtside Seats, a Charlotte Hornets podcast. Chris Kroger with you. Of course, you can download and subscribe an Apple podcast. Just search Courtside Seats. You can search my name, Kroger, K-R-O-E-G-E-R, and make sure you're downloading, subscribing, reviewing. Tell a friend if you don't mind as well. And it's our special bonus episode on this post-NBA Draft Friday. We've talked to Miles Bridges, the first-round selection for the Hornets. The Hornets had two second-round selections. Arnoldis Kubolka, the fifth. 55th overall pick by way of Lithuania and the German National League. Mitch Kupchak said that it, it seems like it's probably going to be a few years before we see Kabolka over here in the NBA. We'll catch up with Mitch Kupchak coming up in just a little bit. We'll continue our conversations with these draft picks. They were in the building at the Hive today, getting used to their new home here in Charlotte. And this guy doesn't have to go that far. A Raleigh native drives a few hours down the road to come to Charlotte, played his college ball at Kansas, Big 12 Player of the Year this year. A consensus All-American as well. And that second-round pick by way of trade with the Atlanta Hawks, 34th overall, Devontae Graham out of Kansas. All right, we got the second-round pick for the Charlotte Hornets in last night's 2018 NBA draft. Actually, there were two of them. One of those guys, he's actually on the other side of the country. This guy is right in our own neck of the words. we got Raleigh native... Kansas Jayhawk, he's proudly repping his KU Jayhawks on his tie. He's wearing that blue blue suit as he comes in today. Devontae Graham, the 34th overall pick in the NBA draft. Devontae, welcome to Charlotte, man. What's going on? How you doing? I'm great. I'm great. You're running on E. That's okay. We can say that. It's okay. You're running on E right now. I am. I definitely am. But this is one of these days where, what, an hour and a half of sleep last night? Yep. yep. You're okay with that? This is one of those days. This is a day you're going to remember for the rest of your life. You got to be okay with it. You got to. So what? Take me back. You're you're at home last night. Where were you watching the draft at? I was in Durham. I was I just had all my family and friends come. We rented out a little hotel space and like a little ballroom and just watched it on a projector screen. Yeah. So you had party, food, all that party, stuff. Party, food, you know, yeah. wings and stuff. Yeah. Pool table, play cards and stuff. Kind of the pass of time. So. Were you nervous last night, or were you just saying, you know what, what's going to be is going to be? I'll just I'm ready for my name to get called. Once it got to 28, I got real nervous. Yeah. My agent told me that I probably might go like mid 30. So once it got to like 31, 32, I started sweating, and then out of nowhere, 34 came and they called my name. I had no idea. When was the last time you were that type of nervous before? Did you get nervous <laughs> playing games like that? I mean, you played in a Final Four before, yeah. so. I can't tell you. I don't know. That's just a different type of feeling. Yeah. It's yeah. just uncertainty. You don't yeah. know. So, you know, I really don't get nervous at, at KU playing in, in those type of games. But uh, I was definitely nervous last Okay. Night. So your phone rings, right? No. No? What happens? So has, well, tell me, take us through that, right? Like what yeah. happens when you find out, all right, you're getting selected? That was, that's what I thought. That's what I thought would happen. Like I thought my agent would be like, okay, yeah, we're, you're going such and such. Yep. But that didn't happen. Like I was literally talking, think to one of my friends or my sister or somebody and looking down at my phone and then I just heard my name and like the room just went crazy. On TV like, you heard your name? Yeah. On the projector screen, they said Atlanta Hawks select Devontae Graham. And then I was like, whoa, because I get, get no call or nothing. So how long did it take you to take a couple minutes for like just reality to kind of the room to quit swirling around? You're like, okay, now. Yeah, we probably celebrated for like a good yeah. 10 minutes. <laughs> so you at that, to- at that point, you probably thought you were going to Atlanta still. Yeah. And like three, four minutes afterwards, got a text saying that I was going to Charlotte, though. So... Once I seen that text, I 
said, hold on, hold on, everybody, we're going to Charlotte. And then they just went crazy. They went, that, what? What? That had to be an incredible feeling, right? Like, this is home. I know it's not home, but it is right. home. This is North Carolina. This was, is home to you. Yeah, we was excited because we thought Atlanta was close, but this is even closer. So we got really excited. That's awesome. Well, and, and so – Take us through your story, right? So you grow up in Raleigh. You play at what Broughton High School, yeah. And then you go to New Hampshire. Mm-hmm. What, what take what? What happened? What leads you to New Hampshire to go play play your high school ball uh, for a few years? I highly recruited out of high school, so uh, I had like East Carolina, Western Kentucky, App State, yeah, uh, Murray State. So I ended up going with App State, signing and and trying to get out of that uh, letter of intent. And uh, the coach at the time wouldn't let me out of it, so. Uh, I ended up going into a prep year, so I wouldn't have to sit out a year, and um, just kind of blew up in New Hampshire. Really, yeah. Playing with guys, I played with Donovan Mitchell, Jonah Bolden. Chris On the Tyler. same team, you played with Donovan yeah, Mitchell. These, yeah, Isaac Copeland, Jared Terrell. So we had a, we had won the national prep championship game. So. Uh, we had a nice little squad. So you guys rolled up on the floor, and people were like, "I'm messing with this team." Yeah, we, we was definitely like that. Now that I think about, it, like, if I look back and realize that what kind of team we had, we were stacked. Did you think that at the time? Like, okay, some of us are going to go play high level college ball. We're going to get to the NBA. Did oh, you like at that time? Did we you talked think? About yeah, it. yeah, we definitely talked about it. For me at the time, it wasn't really, you know. Like a in the picture for me because I was just the kid going supposed to be going to App State, but they were already committed to like Louisville and UCLA and all of that. So, uh, but once I got to Kansas and started, you know, rolling, it definitely became a picture. So it's funny you got a way about you, like you got a, you kind of got an aura, a swagger about you. You got a your hair. I am so jealous of your hair, by the way. Like your suit, the tie, everything. Like you walk into a room, like you command presence. And I've just met you in the last few hours, but I like you get you've got that vibe about you. And Bill Self said that to you, right? Like, hey, yeah. you come to you come to to Lawrence, and you're gonna be a rock star here, right? Yeah. Like yeah. you got the personality, the way you play, all that stuff. They definitely told me that when I first got on campus, uh, but I was like, nah, no way. Like they're just saying that. You, you know? thought he was just he was yeah, just yeah, blowing you up, just yeah, trying to boost my head up yeah. and stuff like that. You know, try to make me play harder or something. So, uh, but nah, uh, I just be being me, man, being outgoing and, and smiling and laughing and just trying to have fun all the time. And it just kind of, you know, attracted to the fans and kind of they loved it. But you love that part, right? Mm-hmm. Like that's so you love KU. You had a great run, three elite eights, one final four during your four years. You're a big 12 player of the year, but connecting with the fans, that, that was a big part of your time yeah, there. Yeah, that was definitely one of the most, my favorite parts, you know, just because of how much love that they show, like appreciation that they show for the players and the organization and, and just everything and how they support us. It's unbelievable. So, you know, when you get a chance and, and you see little kids just like get wide eyed and idolize you. So it's just kind of like giving back. It's just, you just feel like it's just, just what you're supposed to do. Yeah, I remember your your speech on senior night. Mm-hmm. That was uh, you, that was real emotional, right? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's yeah. crazy. Yeah. Uh, I haven't rewatched it, but yeah. like I see little clips about it, and I just got turned it. Yeah, off I can't watch that. Like, no. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. So tell us about your game. You, I mean, this is the other cool part. Is so you're 23. You're real mature. I think you're mature even beyond your age. And your game has grown so much in the last couple of years. You played behind Frank Mason for a little while, but you became that that ball handler. I don't know if you want to call yourself a point guard or not. You're just yeah. a guard, and you make plays. And I mean, your control of an offense, I think, really yeah. skyrocketed the last year or so. Yeah, I think that's what a lot of NBA teams wanted to see, uh, me, which was me playing the point because uh, I'm not as big as a two guard would be usually. Uh, so, uh, but I've always considered myself a point guard. Um, once I got to Kansas is really when I, I played off the ball, which is just better for the team at the time. So, you know, I just want to win. And, and me being on the ball, if that wasn't going to help us win, I didn't want to do it. So I, I made shots, and Frank set me up, and, and we had a great time playing together. You said earlier at the press conference you didn't get to talk to Mike. You're like, Miles like, yeah, I already talked to Mike. Mm-hmm. And you're like, Mike, Michael Jordan, that is. Mm-hmm. And you're like, no, I haven't gotten to talk to him yet. That needs yeah. to happen. So, what do we have in a? Has this been put on the to do list yet? You've been moved around this this building so much yeah. today. So, what happened? What's going on there? Um, man, I don't, I don't think I'm gonna get to meet him today, man. Not today, but we're gonna make that happen, oh, right? Yeah, definitely. Okay, got to. We'll yeah, come back anytime. It, it, it's no rush today. Yeah, 
got got a busy schedule going on right now. So what did your your early interactions with with JB, Coach mm-hmm. Borrego, and then Mitch? What what have those conversations? I know it's still early. You guys are yeah. gonna get to know each other better yeah. and feel it out. But just, what just those, those early conversations been like? Yeah, just a little bit getting to know each other, and we talked about coming back for summer league and how the guys are here, and um, you know, basically that when when I need to be back and getting getting to work and stuff yep. like that. So really excited about me and just how they had to move up and get me and stuff like that. So it was just a pretty general conversation. I don't need to give you any advice. You probably already know this, but Kemba's a stone cold killer. Mm-hmm. You need to you need to cozy on up to that guy. I know. Take, take, I know. Go get underneath his wings. See, that guy's a stone cold killer in the NBA. Definitely going to do that for sure. Yeah. Well, hey, I know you're tired, man. You got just very little sleep mm-hmm. last night, uh, but we're excited to have you in Charlotte. I know Hornets fans are excited, and you're back home, which is which is great. And I mean, it'll be summer league here in the next few weeks. We'll we'll go out to Vegas together. We're gonna have fun, and it's gonna be interesting to see this team take the court. Yes, sir. Appreciate that, man. I'm excited. We're rolling along special bonus episode of Courtside Seats. Chris Kroger with you on this Friday off the NBA draft last night. Of course, DeAndre Ayton goes number one. Marvin Bagley goes number two. Maybe the first major thing that seemed to throw everybody for a loop was Trey Young going at three by way of trade with the Mavericks, who took Luka Doncic at five, but he actually went number three to the Hawks. So you get that swap in between. You got some movement as well. Mo Bamba going to the Magic. Kevin Knox uh, going to the Knicks. You had Colin Sexton in there to the Cavs as well. And that's where you started to see the board set up for the Hornets at number 11 overall. And they select Shea Gilgis Alexander before swapping picks, dropping back a spot with the Clippers last night and getting Miles Bridges in the process at number 12, picking up a few future second round picks as well in exchange and using some other second round picks to trade back in to the second round at 34 to get Devontae Graham out of Kansas, a Raleigh kid. So the Hornets getting that done and also, again, 55th overall, second round selection, Arnoldis Kuboka at Lithuania, maybe a draft and stash player. So let's talk about all this. How did it unfold in the war room on draft night? Mitch Kupchak really was looking forward to being back at the helm of a basketball operation. He got to do it last night for the Hornets and had a busy night on the phone a lot. Let's figure out what went down on draft night inside the war room for the Hornets with the president of basketball ops and the GM, Mitch Kupchak. Three guys in the fold, a lot of deals that were done last night. And uh, you walk away in the first round with Miles Bridges, come away in that second round with Devontae Graham as well. And we'll talk about that international player, what that means as well. But Mitch, uh, great job. It's good to see you. Thank you. Um, it was an exciting day. Um, got a player that we thought we had a chance to get. Uh, did not anticipate getting Devontae. You know, that was a bonus that came along during the draft. We realized that uh, we could move up in the draft and maybe trade some of the seconds we got to improve ourselves and get a much better pick in the second. Uh, so that was the last kind of minute addition um, that, based on our roster, I think makes things look a little bit more even You know, from the depth chart. Uh, we're hoping, as both experienced college players, that they both can make a contribution next year. Of course, Miles played two years only, but Devontae played four, which is unusual because a lot of the kids we draft only play one. Yeah. Well, let's talk about Miles. Before we talk about him as a player and what you what you think of him, you made a trade. So I, I think one of the interesting aspects is you you got your guy that you wanted, and you were able to move back and acquire extra assets to do it. How, how did that un, all unfold last night, and, and how quickly did that come together? Was that something you initiated, or was that something that, that the Clippers brought to you? Uh, we initiated it uh, based on you know our feel. You know, you speak to agents, you know, you call general managers and everybody's trying to piece the draft together you know when you're drafting in the 20s and the 30s it's very hard to piece it together but when you're drafting in the top 10 or 12 and you know you're not going to get the first five or six you're really dealing with maybe six or seven teams and it's you know it's just a little bit easier to to try to piece it together Uh, once we realized that you know there was an opportunity for us to get the player we wanted and at the same time you know extract some picks from another team uh, by the way, which I'm sure they were happy to pay because they got the guy that they wanted. Mm-hmm. Uh, that was a bonus for us because we were able to use those picks to move up later in the draft and get Devonte. So when you look at Miles's game, uh, you didn't—he did not work out here individually, and we could talk about that. But 
you're a fan of his game. You talked about his his character off the court, um, but his versatility on the court. What's the scouting report uh, in an elevator pitch, if you could, though, Mitch? What's what's the the scouting report on Miles Bridges? Well, he's got gifts athletically, you know that most of us don't have, and uh, a lot, we see a lot of players you know, that do have those gifts, but they really decide not to do much with it. Um, you know, the way he was brought up, um, the way he works, you know, his understanding is a very, very bright kid. Um, his character, uh, his coaching uh, lead us to believe that you know, he, he's a good player now, but he's only going to get better. Now, the only way these kids get better is if they, they study the game and, and they work. And we think both these kids will do that. Initially, uh, Miles will be able to help us, you know, on the defensive side of the ball. You know, that's really all about understanding, you know, the team concept and providing you have the ability. You know, we're not talking about shooting the ball or passing the ball. We're just talking about the ability to move your feet, mm-hmm. you know, to be a good teammate and to understand the defensive concepts. You, know, you can make a contribution, and he does have that ability. Today's game, there's a lot of uh, switching, you know, between the one and the four. A lot of times you could start out guarding the, the, the four and end up guarding a two. So I think he can switch and defend multiple positions. He might be able to guard a a one, you know, at least temporarily. So I think that's what, you know, he has to focus on. Get on the court because you can help defensively. And then the other stuff, you know, he's going to come. You know, he's going to fill the lane. He's going to get breaks. He's going to get tip backs. Mm -hmm. You know, he'll drive the hill drive and he'll get a dunk or a layup. Um, and then they'll figure out his game. So he has to continue to work on the other parts of his game, which is shooting the ball and creating, creating space. So one of the things, and I'm an amateur scout, Mitch, you could tell me about this, what you see on tape and what the scouts have seen on tape with him. I think he's an incredible guy off the ball when he's cutting. He's always cutting relentlessly, finds ways to get open, those spot-up jump shots that he takes, and he's knocked them down with regularity. Like you said, maybe off the dribble is where he's got to take his game, but that element in his game offensively, the cutting, the screening, constantly moving and trying to look and find those spots on the floor seems to be something that he could certainly even get better at, but right now coming out at that position and with that skill set I think is, is pretty impressive. Well, with what Coach Borrego wants to do on the offensive side of the ball, you know, he's got those skills. You know, as you mentioned, he, he moves it out the ball. You know, you're going to see the Hornets play really with a high pace next year, up and down the court, um, you know, moving the ball, mm-hmm. a lot of uh, cutting, a lot of high pick and rolls, a lot of corner threes, uh, inbound the ball as quickly, you know, take off down the court. And that's a perfect fit for the way he plays. Um, in this league, you know, they'd rather give up a, a perimeter shot than, than give up a layup. And once they figure out what your strengths and weaknesses are, now they're going to figure out quickly that he likes to attack the rim. Yeah. And they may say, well, I'd rather have him shoot a three okay, than attack the rim. So now they can take a step back and they're going to dare him to shoot. So eventually, to get a complete game, you know, he's going to have to get to the point where he doesn't have to put it down and create a shot off the dribble. But in this league, you have to be able to make open shots. And he can do that now, but he, he needs to be able to get to do it better. But that's going to come in time. I think defensively, if he concentrates on that, he'll get on the court next year. Yeah, and I think, uh, you could correct me if I'm wrong, I think looking at his numbers when he shot from the NBA range from three last year, right around 36%, but that's pretty, I mean, that's that's a good building block. That's a good starting place for yes. for a guy with his skill set. So let's talk about Devontae really quick. Really interesting storyline. When you think about a local kid from Raleigh, mm-hmm. uh, played high level college basketball, Big Twelve Player of the Year, first team consensus, first team All American. All the intangibles I think you're talking about with Miles seem to be true about Devontae as well. And you said Tuesday leading up to the draft. His team obviously is looking for some sort of ball handling guard who can shoot, dribble, create plays, and I think Devontae checks off a lot of those boxes too. And as you said, you didn't think he'd be there in the 40s. You make a play to go get him at 34 last night. Right. Yeah, he might not be the the veteran ball handling guard that we're looking for in the backcourt because even with him right now, we only have three players back there. Yeah, Malik and Kemba, and now we have Devontae. So I think any basketball fan would look at our depth chart and say hey we're pretty good at the, at the threes and the fours and the fives in fact we're really good but you know maybe we need more help on the backcourt mm-hmm. so that that is an area that 
uh, you know, we'll look to work on and improve you know, between now and the beginning of the season. But having him gives us a little bit of comfort knowing that there is somebody with experience. Now, he doesn't got NBA experience, but he got four years of, of a great program and a great conference with a great coach, experience. Um, I think he's mature beyond his years. Yeah. So there, there's going to be a learning curve. You know, I would hope that it's not a year or two. It might be four or five months, you know, where now all of a sudden it's January or maybe early February, and you're putting him in a game and he's making a contribution. But you saw that at Kansas, I think. You, you go, I think especially you go back his sophomore year to that leap he made junior and se- senior se- se- years where he was asked to do more within the framework of the offense, and he valued the basketball, low turnover guy, and he started making smarter plays with the basketball as well, and that's the growth. And I know a lot of people say, you know, four-year players, it's almost a curse word in today's NBA, he's 23, he is what he is, but I don't, I don't think that's true, Mitch, right? I mean, at, at any age, he, he maybe physically he's developed to a certain point, but the skill level, there's always room for growth in a player's game. Yeah, and I, and I think for a for a ball handling guard, it's actually to their advantage. Um, you know, it's not like he has to. I, I think his skill level is fine. Yeah, you know, with his ability to shoot the ball, his ability to handle the ball, make plays. So really, now it's not about increasing or improving his skill level or getting stronger or getting you know quicker or anything like that. He he's pretty. He's a pretty good package. Now it's just about understanding the NBA it's game. The mental element. Yeah. So I don't think his age, you know, is going to. You know, hurt him in that regard. Um, you know, with some of the the younger players, you know, who are seven, eighteen, and nineteen years old, you know, they've still got to grow into their body, and that is going to take some time. I, I don't think, you know, his age is going to hurt him. It, it might actually help him getting in front of the curve. Arnoldus Kubolka. Uh, hopefully, I said Arnoldus's name correctly. I think I did. So he played in the German league, Lithuanian. How did how would how would he have been on this on the radar for for this team? Well, we got the 55th pick, yeah, and it's tough to trade the 55th pick. It's tough to find a partner because the partner is going to say, well, if I give you a future pick, it's probably going to be better than the one you're giving me. Yeah. So not many teams would look to trade a future pick you know, for the pick we had at 55. So really all you can do at that point if you don't want the pick is sell it. Now, from where I sit, you know, and I don't own the team, but I can't do anything with the money. I'd rather have the pick and somehow use the pick to get a player. Uh, We didn't feel uh, that it made sense for us to pick a domestic player or an American player with that pick because of our roster right now. Um, So if you're not going to use it for a domestic player and you want to use the pick, the only thing left really is to find a player in Europe that you're comfortable with. Now, we would not have drafted him yesterday if we didn't feel really comfortable, we probably would have ended up selling the pick. Mm-hmm. Otherwise, you get stuck with the pick, or you draft a guy from our country, and you bring him to camp, and even if he's good, you got to cut him, yep. which is just a waste. But there was a guy that we targeted throughout the draft. Uh, in fact, you know, we spent a lot of time on him the last three or four days, You know, not only watching film, but talking to his representative and make sure that if we did draft him, you know, he would be agreeable to spend a couple of years, at least a year in Europe. Uh, and we'll go watch him. You know, we might bring him to Charlotte, you know, to visit. I think it's remote that he would play in summer league, but all those things are possible. So we're just hoping that we could keep him over there for a year or two. He's only 20, Mm -hmm. and maybe maybe he gets better, and maybe one day he's on the Charlotte Hornets. Do you ever envision a scenario? I know you say it's not going to be this year, uh, but is there a scenario where maybe he's he's a candidate for the Swarm in the G League? Is he that type of player, or do you see that maturation process happening more overseas and then bringing him over to be a part of, of, of this NBA club? Well, he's a draft choice. Yeah. Um, so if we do bring him here and we sign him, uh, he is eligible to being sent down to the swarm, and that would be at our discretion. Uh, there is another component, you know, recently that's called the two-way contract mm-hmm. that would make that a possibility also, um, which gives him an opportunity to not only come up to the Hornets, but play on the Swarm, but actually be compensated more than he would be if he was just a G League player. Okay, so those are options. I don't see those playing out in the next year. That might be possible a year or two down the road. Okay. Mitch, we'll, we'll leave you with this. I know we talked 
gosh, over a week ago about just getting back in the rhythm, getting back in the flow. So being back in the war room last night, how, how much fun was that for you? Just on a personal and professional level, just to go through that process again. You know, it was fun. It's a, it's a very, very exciting. It's, it's very stressful yeah. because there's a lot going on. There's a lot of people watching. There's a lot at stake. Um, you know, there's a lot happening all at once. I mean, there was a period of time where, you know, there were 10 phones ringing at the same time and, and buzzes on a phone and I'm on a phone and we're switching phones back and forth and there's people at the board. Uh, so, you know, it's a lot of action. It's, it is to some degree stressful, but you know, at the end of it all, when it got quiet, you know, Larry Jordan and I and Buzz were sitting in my office about one thirty, quarter to two last night, and we looked at the the last five or six hours and just said, okay, what did we accomplish and how do we feel about it? And everybody felt really, really good, despite all the activity and you know the ups and downs yeah. of a draft. And I thought this guy was going to be there, and where did this guy go? And could we have gotten a better deal here? When you put it all together, we felt great about, you know how the, the, the draft day was handled. Now, okay, that's today. The only way to really know is to wait three or four years. We'll yeah. look back on it. And I'm really hopeful that all three of these kids that we drafted turn into be productive players and productive citizens. And the picks we got, I hope we use those picks wisely going forward. Well, it, it's just funny because what I've garnered to know about you through other people and just being around you over the last few weeks you're methodical, you've got a vision, you're organized, you trust your work, you trust your people's work, and you look like a proud parent this morning. You've got a, I know you didn't sleep very much, but you got a glow about you this morning. Uh, just of You trust, you're, you're proud of the work you did. And as you said, the hay's in the barn, we'll find out down the road what this turns into. But that's what you have to do. But you've got that confidence in the work that you did leading up, and last night was just the fulfillment of that. Yeah, I think we did the best we could do. Yeah. Okay, the, the draft is an animal that you really never know how it's going to end up. Yeah. Okay. Okay. And there weren't really that many surprises, but we felt we did the best we can do. You know, I will look back on some things and say, wow, maybe we could have done better. But I also know we could have done a lot worse, too. But I think we did the best we can do under the circumstances, the time constraints, um, and the manner and the timing in which we got information. Uh, so that's a good thing. I'm very happy with the two players. And I hope our kid in Europe, you know, continues to work. Maybe visit such in Charlotte in a couple of weeks. Mm -hmm. We get to know him, and he improves also. Well, Mitch, great job, uh, it, and it's uh, we're grateful for you to make a few moments for us. And welcome to life on the East Coast. Okay, things end later. You got to be up earlier, so go get some sleep. Okay, that you was the it. big adjustment. Then normally on the West Coast, I'm driving home about ten fifteen. It's a little different around here. It was a little different here. The three hour difference made it, and and you got to get up at the same time. So, uh, but I didn't sleep much. I know there's a lot of excitement, a lot of adrenaline going, and maybe this weekend I'll catch a couple hours. But you know we're we're we're, we're happy. You know we love the support we're getting from the city of Charlotte, and we just want to get this team to perform, and and hopefully get into the playoffs. NBA Draft last night. It calls for a special bonus episode of Courtside Seats, a Charlotte Hornets podcast. Find us in Apple Podcast. You can search Courtside Seats. You can search Kroger, my name, K-R-O-E-G-E-R. -E -E you could search Charlotte Hornets. Once you find us, hit subscribe. Make sure you're downloading and leave a review and also spread the word. We're going to be dropping a new podcast again at the beginning of next week. And we'll just leave you with this. Not so subtle tease. He was in the building over the last couple of days. The original draft pick in Charlotte Hornets history. We had a long sit down with him going down memory lane and talking a lot of Charlotte Hornets memories. You're not going to want to miss that conversation. We'll bring that to you early next week. And as anything comes up, like draft night last night, we'll bring you some special bonus episodes in between. Thanks to everybody that was hanging out with us today. Mitch Kupchak, GM, President of Basketball Operations for the Hornets. The two new selections in addition to Arnoldus Kuboka, who is not in the building today. But Devontae Graham, Miles Bridges, glad to have those guys in the fold. We'll see you guys back next week right here on Courtside Seats, a Charlotte Hornets podcast.